Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this Breakfast Bites. Those of you who have attended these events before will know full well that they're designed to be user-friendly, very informal, um, over coffee and croissants, and a chance for all of us to engage in conversation about the topic that we're dealing with. Naturally, we've had to modify things a little this time. We hope we'll find it, you will find it equally useful. We're going to be looking at philosophical belief and, and the threshold test um, that needs to be established uh, in order to, to get through that gateway uh, and establish philosophical belief. Um, it's a fertile area for growth, perhaps, and one in which we could potentially, at least, um, find a way to fill some gaps in our current equality legislation. I'm delighted to be joined today by Kerry Gardner and, Alan William, uh, and uh, Anna Williams. Kerry joined the Guildhall employment team uh, last year. We've known her for a very long time, and it was to our delight that, that she, chose to, she chose to join our team. Anna, on the other hand, uh, has just moved into her second six pupillage, and as luck would have it, that coincided exactly with the time at which the tribunal pulled the plug on cases for the next three months, uh, at least on live cases. We know that for Anna, this is nothing more than a, a tiny temporary blip. We're confident she has a, a great career ahead of her, and I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, hearing what she has to say today. Let's just look at the agenda for today and uh, see what we have coming up in the next hour. We're starting with Anna's introduction to the concept surrounding the philosophical belief test. Um, Kerry and I will then be picking up two key cases that were heard recently. And then at least half of this session will be spent on a discussion between the three of us. It's meant to be informal, really the sort of thing that we might well do over a cup of coffee when we all have a bit of time, well, at least in the good old days when we were able to do that. So uh, enough from me, um, introduce you to Anna and she can start on our first agenda item. Thank you very much, Debbie. So the starting point for thinking about philosophical belief in employment law is to think about section 10.2 of the Equality Act. And hopefully the definition should appear on the screen um, now. So in terms of thinking about uh, that definition, um, which sets out that belief, oh, it doesn't seem to have come up just yet. There we go. So in terms of thinking about that definition, I think there are two points worth making. First is that this is a very broad definition. Belief includes a lack of belief, and it also includes any religious or philosophical belief. And secondly, I think, the definition is quite circular. Belief is defined as including any, any religious or philosophical belief. With that in mind, the courts have sought to provide some further guidance on this, most notably in the form of the Granger criteria provided by Mr Justice Burton. He sets out five criteria that a belief must, must have to qualify. First, a belief must be genuinely held. Second, and it be uh, not an opinion or a viewpoint. Third, it must be a, a weighty or substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. Fourthly, there must be a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance. And fifthly and finally, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not incompatible with human dignity and not in conflict with the fundamental rights of others. Now, I don't plan to go through these in great detail because we're going to be touching on them again in the discussion section later on. I do have a wish to make two points about this, and that's in relation to the first two criteria. These are going to be areas of really complex fact and evidence. They're very much going to depend on the particular individual litigant and the view that they're seeking to advance in front of the tribunal. Turning to the second three, uh, three, four and five, those again are going to require complex issues of evidence and fact. But importantly, they're also going to raise complex issues of principle and broad evaluative judgment. They might be things on which there's a broad spectrum of opinion, both in terms of the public opinion and perhaps also the opinion of judges hearing these cases. And so in that sense, it may be difficult sometimes to predict where a particular belief falls on either side of a line of whether it's going to be protected 
or not. And therefore, it's going to provide a very interesting battleground for working out the future frontiers of philosophical belief. In that respect, in, in combating some of the uncertainty, it may be worthwhile to draw on some of the authority from Strasbourg and the European Convention on Human Rights. The final point that I wish to make before thinking about some of the applications of philosophical belief in the case law is to really emphasise this distinction between holding a belief and manifesting a belief. Now, this is most clearly set out in European human rights law in Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. This article expressly protects the freedom to hold a belief, but also to manifest it. Importantly, the freedom to hold a belief is unqualified, whereas the freedom to manifest a belief is a qualified right and can be limited in accordance with the Convention. And this approach has been recognised in the UK context in the wider judgment, which concern four UK claimants and claims concerning their rights to manifest their Christian beliefs in different ways brought before the Strasbourg Court. Moving on from the European Convention on Human Rights to EU law, this is notable in that the same distinction between holding and manifesting isn't as clear in the EU directive and also the UK law which implements it. Nonetheless, the Court of Justice has made it very clear that it will interpret the protections for religion and belief consistently with the Article 9 protections in the Convention, and that's in the ACBITA case which concerned a, an employer's ban on wearing veils in the workplace. So that leads us to the interesting question of what this means for UK law. As we've already seen in Section 10.2 of the Equality Act, the right to manifest a belief isn't expressly recognised. However, as courts and tribunals have an obligation to interpret this legislation consistently, both with the Convention and also although I'm not going to get into the specifics because it's a very complicated and emerging area, retained EU law. This means that tribunals and courts will recognise that the Equality Act protects um, the right to manifest religion. But that rather begs the further question of, of how. There is no comparable provision to um, the Convention which allows the right um, to manifest a belief to be qualified. So does that mean that there are ever going to be circumstances under the Equality Act where an employer can put restrictions on that right to manifest a belief? I think that's probably going to be a question that's, that's more a question of theory rather than practice. In many cases involving manifestation issues, these are going to be dealt with as indirect discrimination claims and can be justified in the ordinary course. To the extent that uh, direct discrimination claims arise, the waste any judgment will be very important. Here the EAT made clear that they will draw a distinction when considering the reason why treatment occurred between holding and manifesting a belief and the inappropriate manifestation of a belief. And the inappropriate manifestation will not attract the protection of the Equality Act. The EAT has further pro provided guidance in pointing out that when deciding whether something is appropriate or inappropriate, Article 9.2 of the Convention, the, the provisions on when the right to manifest a belief can be qualified, will uh, be illustrative and will provide the guidance there. So through the back door, the European Convention rights are, are going to be protected in the same way in UK law. I think that leaves us with two interesting questions to think about in terms of protected beliefs for the future. The first is that the distinction between holding and manifesting a belief is somewhat malleable, particularly where the belief is that one must do something, and that's what we'll see that in the context of the veganism case later on. It might be difficult to say where holding a belief ends and where manifesting it begins. And secondly, that this is legally speaking very important. That first stage, whether or not a belief is protected, is a zero sum game. Either one qualifies for the protections of the Equality Act or one doesn't. Whereas if you manage to get through that threshold stage, the question becomes different. It's a broader question of whether a restriction can be justified. And therefore, it will be very important for both respondents and claimants to be identifying in where the ways that they are pleading and running cases, whether this is a manifestation or a holding case. So finally, I'm just going to look at the application of that in the case law. 
So on this side, we have examples of where protected beliefs have been found to be covered by the Equality Act. We have the spiritualism case in power, Hawkins, the belief that one should not lie under any circumstances, Anderson, a commitment to public service, and the Henderson left-wing democratic socialist beliefs. Now, these are very important in terms of giving um, examples as to when uh, protected beliefs will qualify, but they are only that, they're examples in the sense that everything is going to be quite fact dependent. And so while we can learn something from these, that might be also limited in certain circumstances. Conversely, on the other side, we also have examples where beliefs haven't qualified. The Kelly case of Marxist and Trotskyist views is perhaps useful as a contrast to some of the political views which have been protected on the other slide, showing where the, the boundary is as to when things will not be deemed worthy of respect in a democratic society. In particular, the court there picked up on the fact that it, um, participants felt that it was appropriate to break the law in order to further those views. The Farrell case um, and the case about um, Holocaust denial, again, may provide clear examples of when beliefs will not be um, worthy of respect in a democratic society. The Gray case, a recent one, is interesting in terms of thinking about evidencing beliefs, particularly given in that case, the claimant hadn't um, raised this issue of belief in copyright until the start of litigation, which went very clearly to the issue of genuine beliefs and is a good reminder for both claimants and respondents to have a good document trail. And finally, the Conisby case, the vegetarianism case, uh, this was a case where uh, vegetarianism didn't meet the threshold because the judge felt that it was a lifestyle choice. And I think that can be contrasted um, and what much can be learned from the veganism case, which Kerry's about to talk about. So I'll just pass on to her to deal with that one. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and of course, most of you will have heard of the, the case of Casamigiano and Costa, not least because when it came out, it attracted a lot of um, press attention. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, given the growth in veganism in the, the world today. And, and most of you will be aware that the judge did in fact find that ethical veganism is a protected belief. But nonetheless, I think it's a really interesting decision to just take a further look at. Now, in terms of, of those that missed it, um, it arose out of the respondents' pension funds, and in particular the way that contributions were invested in ways that the claimant deemed unethical and in particular they were invested in organisations that test on an animals or cause harm to animals. Now he brought a variety of claims but as we know the bulk of that was in relation to his philosophical belief. Now it's an interesting case because at the outset the respondent conceded that ethical veganism was a protected belief but being a matter of jurisdiction under section 10 the tribunal also needed to be satisfied that it was in fact a capable of amounting to a philosophical belief, hence the reason for the hearing. The, the second point to note about the, the decision is that it's based on ethical veganism as opposed to dietary vegans or health vegans, or, or more aptly put, I would say, those that adopt a plant-based diet. And, and whilst the claimant laid out his beliefs in some detail in his witness statement, he made clear that the starting point was the definition that was penned by the Vegan Society, which you can see on your screen now. And we can see in that definition that it's not just about excluding as far as possible um, all forms of exploitation of cruelty in relation to food, but clothing or other purposes. And also one of the key points in the decision was by extension, the promoting the development and use of animal free alternatives. Um, so that's the, the definition that the employment judge relied upon when giving his decision. Now, he applied the, the test laid down in Granger and in applying those criteria, he held as follows. He said that, um, and it, perhaps not surprisingly, when I take you through the reasons, that there was no doubt whatsoever that the claimant genuinely and sincerely holds his belief in veganism. And, and, and the way that the evidence was put um, it was in a significant amount of detail and facts, important facts in this case that showed how the claimant adhered to that belief was not only did he hold um, have a 100% vegan diet, he wouldn't even allow vegan food, a uh, non-vegan food, sorry, to be brought into his, uh, his home. He would only consume food that he knew um, didn't harm animals at all in its production. 
um, or it, it's, it, it's growth even. So for example, he wouldn't eat figs because they're grown in a symbiotic relationship with a, a little microscopic wasp and you can never really be sure whether there's any lava, lava inside, so he wouldn't eat those. Um, he wouldn't buy any product that was tested on animals. He wouldn't wear any clothes, shoes or hats or any fashion accessories that were made out of animal products. And he also took all reasonable steps to ensure that any financial products that he had didn't invest in pharmaceutical companies um, unless they avoided testing on animals. He, he didn't visit zoos or circuses or, or animal races or anything that involved live animals. And since becoming vegan, he also has only held jobs that are in the field of animal protection. His beliefs would go as far as him avoiding sitting on leather seats or holding le leather straps, for example, those that we see on perhaps public transport. He would regularly participate in animal protection marches or demonstrations and protests and in fact he was a regular speaker at such events. He would avoid social gatherings if food, the food served was non-vegan. Uh, he wouldn't date anybody that wasn't also a vegan and um, he would also avoid using notes to pay for services or products because of the animal fats in, in the, the new um, notes. And, um, and perhaps one of the things that makes this case stand out from others is the fact that he would walk to destinations if they were within an hour walking distance um, rather than getting public transport because he was concerned about accidental crashes with insects or birds on his way. So it's not surprising in light of those facts and that background that the judge held that he genuinely and sincerely held his, holds his belief. Now, looking at the second point of the Granger test, the, the judge held that it was clear that veganism is living according to a belief or conviction, that it's wrong to exploit and kill living beings unnecessarily. Um, he found in relation to the third point that the belief is at its heart between the interaction of human and non-human animal life and is plainly a substantial aspect of human life and it has sweeping consequences on um, human behaviour and therefore he held that it was clearly capable of constituting a belief um, name which seeks to avoid the exploitation of fellow species. Um, fourthly, the judge held that it was without a doubt a belief with, which obtains a high level of cogency, cohesion and importance. And again, in reaching that conclusion, he relied upon the Vegan Society definition and he said it's clear that that threshold is, is met. Finally, the judge went on to consider the final point in the Granger test, and he held that there, there was clearly no conflict between veganism and human dignity, as humans are also sentient beings and need to be equally respected and protected. So he said that um, ethical veganism isn't in conflict with other rights. It doesn't require other vegans to, or sorry, non-vegans to behave in a particular way. And given modern day thinking, clearly ethical veganism does not offend society. And I think that's a particularly interesting point that we'll touch upon later, and that is that what is or is not a, a protected philosophical belief is a fluid concept, depending on the, the views of society at any given time or the beliefs of society. So just looking at what we can take from this decision. So first and foremost, we must remember that the decision is not binding. Um, it's not going to be appealed, not, not surprisingly, given that the respondent conceded the issue. However, it is a, um, as I said, it's a, it's a first instant decision, so it's not binding. That aside, um, what are the chances of an, another ethical vegan satisfying the test, given the specific facts in this case? Now, at first glance, it may seem that the way that Mr. Kas Kasimit Jana Costa conducted his life, um, other vegans may not be protected. For example, not all vegans will work in uh, animal protection. Not all vegans will go as far as um, walking an hour to avoid crashes with insects and birds and wildlife. And not all vegans will speak at demonstrations or attend them on such a regular basis. But it's my view that nonetheless, the decisions are really compelling in future cases. And I say that because the tribunal adopted the vegan society definition and if we looked at that decision again i think what we can see is um, that it clearly does meet the that, that second part of the granger test that anna broke down so three four or five 
Also, um, it's worth bearing in mind that there has been um, cases that are previously brought, in particular in the European Court of Human Rights, as far back as 1993, which confirmed that veganism is capable of constituting a belief for the purposes of Article 9.1. So there is that uh, um, precedent there to rely upon. And, and that view is reiterated in the European Convention of Human Rights guidance. But that aside, I think there are three other points that make it fairly easy for other vegans or other ethical vegans to rely um, or to get through over the, the threshold. And that firstly, is that the threshold is actually fairly low, particularly when we're talking about genuineness of belief. It's not about an inquiry as to the validity of the belief or testing it to an objective standard, but merely limited to ensuring that the belief is, is, is in good faith. And, and it's also, I think, important to note in light of that, that a, an occasional transgression from a belief is unlikely to prevent a finding in favour of an ethical vegan claimant. Secondly, it's long been recognised that um, individuals are entitled to hold beliefs that perhaps appear irrational or inconsistent and may be surprising to others. And I think that that may well be an important point in other uh, ethical vegan cases. And, and finally, uh, it's long been recognised as far back as Aurida and British Airways that belief is intensely personal. So they can easily vary from one person to another. So the fact that not all ethical vegans conduct their lives in the way that Mr. Kazimit Jan Acosta did, I think makes it unlikely to be a bar to protection for future ethical vegans. Of course, it will depend on the individual facts of each case, but I do think this decision leaves the door wide open for other ethical vegans to um, obtain protection. Now, I'm going to hand over to Debbie, who's now going to talk about the, the second case that we think of, is of interest at the moment. Um, I'm looking at the case of Force Data, which some of you will appreciate, um, gained as almost as much press attention as the case Kerry was just talking about. What's interesting about this case is that it had nothing at all to do with religious belief. Religion didn't come into it at all. The basis of the claimant's asserted philosophical belief was purely scientific. Uh, and that's why we're, we're dealing solely with the concept of philosophical belief in an area which, as we well know, nearly always touches on, uh, on religious belief. And the views expressed by the claimant, that the beliefs she claimed were, on, a, on some analysis, I would say, very strong views. Um, and you can see on the slide in front of you that her case was put in two alternative ways. First, a positive belief that being of one gender is an immutable biological fact. It's not a feeling. It's not an identity. It is what it is. Um, the second element of her asserted belief was the absence of belief, remember something that, that Anna just touched on, but the lack of belief that she claimed in these proceedings was a, a lack of belief that people have an inner gender which may be different to the gender in which they are born and that people can effectively transition from one to the other. And that was the way she put her philosophical belief before the employment tribunal. And her witness evidence was very clear that the section in red, um, I think, summarises some lengthy evidence the claimant gave uh, to the judge. It's impossible to change your sex or to lose your sex, she said. Uh, and her evidence was uh, tested and unmoving on that point. The employment judge made the following findings, not surprisingly, on the basis of the evidence that was presented. The core of her belief is sex is biologically, biologically immutable. It cannot be changed. There are two sexes. It is impossible to change from one to the other. Um, her belief, in fact, went a little further. In fact, she, she uh, took the view that it was impossible to recognise gender transition notwithstanding the fact that there is law doing exactly that. Okay, so we're back um, to force data. And what happened is that the judge took the view that in separating the two elements of the claimant's asserted belief, 
The belief that sex is, is immutable is one that passed every single hurdle of the Granger test, apart from the fifth. That is the one where it failed. Her absolutist view um, was incompatible with human dignity and the fundamental rights of others. And uh, that uh, is the element uh, on which that uh, failed. What he then went on to do was to consider the claimant's contention that Gender Recognition Act is nothing but a fiction, that it can do nothing to actually transition uh, somebody's gender, notwithstanding the fact that there's legislation to say it does exactly that. And in those circumstances, the judge found that both the fourth and fifth elements of the uh, Granger test uh, could not be satisfied. And this is what he found in relation to the second element. If her position is, that even a trans, a trans woman with a gender recognition certificate cannot honestly describe herself as a woman, that is not worthy of respect in a democratic society, nor is it compatible with the human rights of others. And it was, I think, the, the very absolute nature of the claimant's views that were probably her undoing in, in this case. She was completely ungiving in terms of there being any other way of looking at the issue of gender identity and, and, and gender status uh, and refuse to accept that there was any other view or any requirement to respect any other view. And the judge found it, I think, not too difficult in those circumstances to find that her approach was not worthy of respect in a democrat democratic society. And also he made the very clear point that those views being so absolutist that human rights balancing exercise when we're looking at the exercise of qualifying rights has to um, has to take that into account and certainly he found that a significant factor. What can we take from force data? As with the vegan case it's only an employment judge's decision albeit one of the better ones. Um, he in fact queried whether this question was even suitable for determination at a preliminary hearing taking the view that it's very, very difficult to separate out the existence of the belief from the way it is manifested and from the things that are said to be justified in the manifestation of that belief. Nonetheless, he did hear the case and, and made the findings that he did. Um, but again, it, it has to be stressed that this is very much a fact-sensitive determination based on the particular belief put forward to the uh, by the claimant. Also an interesting um, point that, that the judge makes in this case is if we're talking about absence of belief and remember that was one element of the, um, the claimant's claim, the Granger test applies in exactly the same way. So we have to apply the five stages to the Granger uh, of the Granger test to absence as well as to the existence of a claimed philosophical belief. And the judge also recognising, as, as other case law has, when we're looking at cogency, seriousness, cohesion and so on, the, the bar is not set very high at all. And he noticed, uh, noted in this case that a scientific, scientific belief that, that the claimant put forward may not be based, based on very good science at all. Uh, and there was a wealth of scientific evidence before the tribunal. Um, it didn't matter as long as it wasn't so irrational that it wasn't able to meet that relatively modest threshold of coherence, that was enough. I, I think what we take from force data is it, it's an interesting case and an interesting application of Granger. However, it's very fact sensitive on, in, a, in a situation where views were absolutist. And I, I think for any employment lawyer dealing with a, a client raising similar issues or, or defending similar issues, I think that uh, the view must be taken that there is definitely room for a different decision where, for example, the belief is not so absolutist or, or not manifested in, in such a way as was in this case. So helpful guidance, does it, does it uh, have any effects so far as precedent is concerned? Absolutely not. It's illustrative, no more, but nonetheless an interesting application of the test. So over to our discussion session, and this is going to encompass two elements. Firstly, what direction are we heading in with this threshold for philosophical belief? 
And secondly, how do we establish or disprove that threshold test? And the first of these is, is one that I'm going to be dealing with. Do we have a widening of the landscape for philosophical belief? My view, possibly yes. A, a wide range of beliefs are capable of falling within the heading of, of philosophical belief. And uh, we can see the, the range of case law that has been coming through the courts in, in recent months and years. It's designed to be broad. That's the whole purpose of it. But it isn't without limitations. And it's just as interesting to explore where those limitations lie uh, as any other aspect of the philosophical belief cause of action. We think that this heading, the protected characteristic of philosophical belief, could be developed in such a way that it starts to fill gaps in the protection already offered by the Equality Act, where the current protected characteristics don't quite cover particular circumstances. And this is something that I think Kerry in particular wants to pick up when we have our discussion session. Before we move on to that, let me just give you a couple of examples of Cut the kinds of cases that have come across my desk in, in the last few months, um, good or bad. Um, one case that, that, that came across my desk was a case of um, a, a belief in English independence, um, not independence from the EU, but independence also from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that the claimant was keen to express. Um, much to the consternation of some colleagues who found his views and the ways he expressed them to be racist. He has put his case very firmly on a philosophical belief basis. It will be interesting to see how that goes in line of the Granger test and, uh, and the steps beyond that. Another example, you know, it was lovely to be dealing with a webinar that didn't concern COVID-19 for a change, um, but my example does. This was uh, something that was floated across my desk just a couple of weeks ago when an employee was dismissed by his employer, summarily dismissed, in circumstances where he is a complete conspiracy theorist, doesn't believe the COVID-19 pandemic is real, believes it's all some major governmental um, conspiracy um, and refused to adhere to the company's social distancing guidelines in circumstances where he and his colleagues were key workers. Um, and he too is, uh, is seeking to argue that his philosophical belief um, is something that ought to kick in and protect him from this dismissal. We'll see. Um, I, I think as things stand at the moment, that, that could be somewhat problematic. But as Kerry said, it's a very fluid concept the state of information, what we know, what society accepts and doesn't is constantly changing. And that's something else that I think we need to bear in mind when we're looking at any of the case law, that a case decided 10 years ago may not necessarily be decided in the same way today. So let's move on to our discussion session. For this, the three of us have each picked an example, just a, 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 an example we've taken out of our heads as to a possible argument um, of genuine um, philosophical belief so that we can talk around these examples when we're looking at how the five Granger points may apply. So this is mine. My um, potential philosophical belief is this, a belief that humans are designed to sleep at night for a eight hours or so and to have that sleep unbroken. So philosophical belief of eight, un eight unbroken hours sleep at night, without, without which the belief is, one is putting one's mental and physical health at risk and one's ability to function properly. And the context for me putting that um, scenario forward is this, the employee in question is refusing to work a shift pattern that includes nights, and is refusing to go on a nighttime on-call rotor. So at that point, Anna, would you like to introduce your um, hypothetical scenario? Yes, so my hypothetical scenario is a belief that family is the most important thing and that one's family should always be put first. And so the context in which I might be thinking about this is perhaps maybe in the current situation, where a worker decides they don't want to go to work 
to stay at home and protect their family, even in circumstances where the current health guidelines say that they don't have to do that, or if they're asking their employer to put in place um, greater protection than the current health guidelines suggest. But also this could apply more broadly to certain situations, for example, wanting to take time off to, to um, uh, do childcare or care for a parents or things like that. How about you, Kerry? What's your um, example? Well, I've been having a think and it, it seems to me that at the moment there is a bit of a, a gap in the Equality Act in that we've got provisions for sex, we've got provisions for gender reassignment, but there it doesn't seem to be anything that adequately covers the, the, um, those that identify as non-binary. Now, I've had a bit of a think about whether this would work as a philosophical belief. And it seems to me that even if we try to shoehorn it into Section 7.1 under gender reassignment, that that's probably not going to work because it requires the person to be proposing or undergoing or having undergone a procedure, which in, in many cases for um, non-binary individuals isn't the case. And in any event, obviously, Section 7.1 is about a process of reassigning sex, which again isn't the, the case when we're talking about non-binary individuals. What we're talking about is gender identity, which is a distinct issue. So with that in mind, and considering the, the full starter decision, is it possible to reverse that and, and pursue a claim on the basis that an individual, a non-binary individual, believes that they are non-binary and believes that an individual's identity can be fluid, um, fluctuate or not fit in with the definition of man or woman? So it's, it's an interesting point. I'm putting out there um, whether it's possible. I, I don't have the, the, the answer, but it's going to be certainly interesting to look at this as we go through the, the Granger criterion. Okay, well why don't we take it step by step, taking each bullet point at a time. Um, genuine belief, we've already touched on this, of course there are two elements, it needs to be belief um, and we'll perhaps pick up with that a little later, but it needs to be genuinely held, that's the other thing and Kerry has already um, referred to the guidance that we had in the case of Aaron Williamson, which effectively tells us that the court is limited to the question of whether the belief was held in good faith or is it some kind of ruse to gain protection that ought not to be granted. So it's a limited inquiry. The courts are not concerned with whether the belief is um, a proper one, a justified one, simply at this stage whether it is genuinely held. The validity is, is not the important thing. Um, so um, I think the other point that, that, that I'd raise at this point is, of course, at the hearing, which is usually months, if not years after the events in question, the claimant is going to assert in his evidence, yes, this is belief, not, not nothing else, and I genuinely have it. And of course, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be sufficient to simply rely on that alone, because what we need to look at is whether that genuine belief existed at the time for which protection is claimed, in other words, at the time of the alleged discrimination. And so we need to make sure, don't we, that there is evidence on which the tribunal can make a finding as to whether there was a genuine belief at the time of the acts that the tribunal is concerned with. And sometimes I, I think there can be a failure to effectively backtrack in the evidence that, put, that is put forward and simply rely on what the claimant's belief may be at that hearing, which of course may be at a substantially later time. So Kerry, in, in the context of your non-binary example, how would you see this applying? I think this is a really tricky one. As I said um, earlier, in order for such a claim to get off the ground, the claimant really does need to be comfortable with pursuing a claim in such a way. And like I said, it's not a perfect solution, it just may be a way in. And so they'd need to be comfortable with it. And, and I, I think that the, the distinction is between I am and I believe I am. And if they're not happy with it, I can easily see how a claim can unravel put on this ground. But, but if they do want to and they are happy, then I think a really detailed and strong witness statement about the, their belief and, and how it impacts them on a daily basis or in their lives is going to be crucial. From a respondent's perspective, I think it's going to be quite tricky to challenge. Of course, unless there's anything obvious that they can um, counter the genuineness of that belief. But as I said, I think it will be tricky. 
And at your situation is a little bit different. How do you see genuine belief coming through in your family life scenario? Well, I, I suppose thinking about it, for example, so say I was coming at it from a perspective of a claimant, I think what I'd really want to do is make sure that the evidence was completely uh, there at the start. I would want to be really looking at the claimant's witness statement, making sure they've really addressed the ways that this affects their life. For example, have they chosen to do a particular job to allow them to fit around their family needs? Have they, for example, in the past moved house to be closer to family to be able to help them out? Those kind of things, really focusing in on, on the particular changes that someone's made, the particular choices that someone's made in accordance with their beliefs. Um, I think any kind of documentation you could use to back that up, um, any times you've mentioned it to the employer, any times you've mentioned it to someone else, and again, these sort of documents looking at your past job history, where you've lived, things like that. This might not be an obvious case of thinking about expert evidence, but there are groups and associations um, that are committed to different parenting styles. And if, the, if that accorded with um, the claimant's particular belief, then it might be really helpful to look at that and bring in that expert evidence as well. But I, I guess, Kerry, what, what would you be doing if you were a respondent and wanted to address some of those points? I think the first thing to do is be to look at how that belief actually played out in the working environment. So has that, that individual applied for time off to care for their dependents or their children? Um, what, what, they, what would they normally do if their child or a dependent was ill? Would they be the one taking the time off or would they be expecting somebody else to do it? Um, and what they know generally about what they do in their spare time, I think all of those might paint a picture about whether that belief is genuineness in order for a respondent to be able to take a view about whether to challenge this assertion or not. Because um, I suppose if, if they're not meeting all those points, then maybe the evidence actually points towards the fact that there's an, an underlying reason for why they're not wanting to do, for example, in the current climate coming to work. Maybe they just don't want to come to work and it's an excuse to, to put family first. But it, it, again, I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because of um, family is, is deeply personal to everyone, isn't it? Yeah, and I think maybe coming back on that, I suppose the only thing you can think of from a claimant's perspective is if the respondent shows that there were areas where you didn't always act in in accordance with those beliefs, um, the response is perhaps that, yes, maybe certain slips are permissible to still have a, a genuine belief. There may also be a question on quite how recent those beliefs are and how important uh, how important therefore what you've done in the past is for determining how genuine things were at the time for example if you just become a parent suddenly family might seem a lot more important to you and how you behaved in the past is then then less relevant is the only way maybe you could deal with that indeed and i think there's certainly a really interesting line isn't there between um following that belief and actually that being a transgression of some sort, where do we say that the cutoff point is here and therefore it can't be a genuine belief if you're not following it yourself? So it's definitely an interesting point, isn't it? Um, moving on then to the second criteria, which is uh, belief, not opinion or viewpoint. Now, this was considered in the case of McClintock and Department of Constitutional Affairs. And in that case, the, the claimant was a, a justice of the peace on the family panel and his belief meant that he couldn't agree to place children with a same-sex couple. Now, the Employment Tribunal held that that was merely a, an, an opinion or viewpoint, um, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, given that the claimant did say that not, it wasn't a matter of principle to reject the possibility of um, same-sex parents, parents never um, having a child placed with them and it being in the child's best interest, but that at the moment there wasn't convincing evidence to support that conclusion. Now, I think what's interesting about this case is that he, he did appeal and um, despite having the opportunity to elaborate on this point, the EAT didn't. They simply said that the decision of the tribunal wasn't perverse. And I think that really leaves it open um, to an argument that a different tribunal could quite easily find differently or take a different view. So I think like there is um, with transgression, with belief or opinion or viewpoint, there clearly is a really interesting line to be drawn as to what falls on one side and what falls on the other. And essentially that's going to depend on the facts of the case um, in every instance, I would suspect. Now, um, Debbie, I think many people are gonna sympathize with your scenario, um, but how do you see it fitting into belief rather than viewpoint or opinion? Okay. 
belief. Oh, eight hours sleep, if only. Um, what would what would I want to show? Um, I would want to start, I think, by explaining as as a claimant um, all the reasons why I hold that belief. Uh, and I suppose that there's overlap with genuineness, but I would also, I think, at this point, want to talk about why. I may want to bring in scientific research papers, articles, and so on, supporting the um, the fact that there is a, a proper line of thought that this is the way to, to be, to live one's life. But that's not enough, of course, for me to show belief, not opinion. I think I too would wanting would be wanting to produce evidence of, um, for example, how a lack of sleep and so on affects me in my life. Um, how I see that affecting others in, in my own professional life and so on. But most importantly, perhaps, how I modify my life in the light of my belief. So the steps I take to make sure that I can adhere to it, um, whether I go out of my way to avoid late nights, to avoid early mornings, whether I would avoid, for example, um, booking flights that, that were overnight flights, um, just the day to day things in it, that I would try to bring forward to show that this isn't just my opinion that this is the best way to be. This, in my view, is the only way to be. It is a belief that this is that this is right. This is this is the case. And uh, I think it has to be very much if, you, if you're going to do this, you have to start bringing in facts and lifestyle choices to the extent that you can to really pin down this belief rather than opinion issue. Anna, from the other side, how would you counter that if you were if you were a respondent facing that sort of um, contention? I think like you, I would also want to be looking at evidence, but I think I would be trying to find a range of evidence. I'd be trying to find um, medical opinion, scientific opinion, saying, well, humans haven't always needed eight hours sleep. Very rarely do people get eight hours sleep. Um, and, and really maybe putting that to the claimant in cross-examination saying, well, yes, well, that's an opinion, your opinion. Can you recognise that there are other opinions and other ways of doing that? And really sort of trying to chip away at belief on, on that basis. And I do recognise one of the issues with that is the thing that you've mentioned earlier, which is it's about their belief at the time. But obviously you can't entirely divorce the two things. And I think if a, a claimant is more willing to accept in the witness box that there are maybe other ways of doing it, other opinions, then it will start to chip away at whether or not their um, professed belief is a belief rather than an opinion. And uh, what about your, your family life example? Can we, can we just touch on that on the same topic? Um, how do you see that working? Let's just flip it so that you're claiming this time and you're trying to present this case. How do you do it in that scenario? I, I mean, I think I'd be doing something pretty similar to the um, genuineness of the belief. Again, looking at this evidence of what that person particularly did. You would want to be looking at their witness evidence and their witness statement, making sure that you really very fully record the emotional reasons for doing it, the practical steps that you take to put that into uh, practice. And again, relying on the research, uh, I think you would really want to be trying to stress that this is uh, drawing that distinction that has been drawn in the case law between a, a lifestyle choice and a belief and anything that you can show of, over and above what might be usual lifestyle choices may help take that that step towards finding that it is a belief. Mm. But I, I wonder how you would respond to that if you were a respondent, Debbie. I think my approach would be to, um, to stress the fact that the, there is a real importance in life balance and life balance means that other things have equal seniority or priority so far as our time is concerned. Um, for example, job satisfaction um, is one thing. There might be equally valid views, for example, that certainly for a, a time, prioritising one's work and to put one's family onto a stable financial footing is, is perhaps a, a, a fair opinion and, 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 to, and to deal with it that way. Um, I think I'd just really be wanting to stress that with, with a scenario like this, that the, the claimant can't really say any more than this is your opinion, but you recognise that other people may and do feel very, very differently and act accordingly. And there are just a range of views. 
And I think from a respondent, I would be saying that, that that individual's decision to really want to prioritise family over anything else is is no more than a lifestyle choice. So I'd be wanting to bring in the Connorsby line of thinking and, and arguing that that's just the way you've chosen to live your life. That's it. There's no philosophical belief. So I, I think that's the way I would I would take that. And then just moving then to the, the fourth point about weight team substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. Now, quite often, I think it's clear from the outset whether something could be said to be weighty and substantial. And the reality is, is it's a relatively low threshold requiring it to be more than merely trivial. So I think it's, it's not surprising when we're looking at cases where this has become an issue that actually the focus tends to be rather on whether the belief concerns an aspect of human behaviour rather than whether it's weighty and substantial. And a really good example of that is the Conisby decision. So that's the vegetarian vegetarianism case that we've, we've touched upon. And, and the judge in that decision found that it didn't concern an aspect of human life or behaviour and was merely a lifestyle choice. So it's, it's, it's an interesting um, distinction again isn't it to be made um, under this heading. So uh, Debbie how do you see the claim overcoming whether it's a weight and substantial -ish aspect of human life in your sweep scenario? Well I wish it were in my life um, <laughs> but I, I would say um, let's be realistic if we're lucky we spend a third of our lives sleeping. Um, there's nothing we do more I don't think with our time and it effects or our sleep or our lack of I would argue affects everything else that we do um, including our, our inabilities to function so well if we don't or to you know have impacts on physical or mental health if on a sustained basis we don't sleep well um, I'd say um, if in doubt about whether this is an important or substantial um, matter just ask an insomniac whether it's important or substantial, uh, maybe one looking at it, one way of looking at it. Um, I say also that looking at the medical research articles and so on about the impact that lack of sleep has on mental health would also be helpful. I mean, we know from dealing with, for example, um, psychiatric um, conditions for, for disability discrimination purposes, what an impact sleep or the, uh, the effect on sleep has on the ability to function and and so we're all very much aware of, of, of what, what that can do. I, I think we just need to remember though that it can be very easy to think something is obvious so you don't need to address it in evidence as well as you might. The trouble is we have a bit of a lottery in the employment tribunal don't we? We don't know which judge we're going to get when we walk into the room or open up our screen or pick up the telephone. And I think it's dangerous to assume that we're gonna have a judge who will appreciate the nuances of some of the issues that these cases raise. If you're lucky, you will. If you're not, you won't. Um, so my view is that you absolutely need to make sure that you are properly evidencing the cogency, the cohesion, the importance when you're, when you're putting your, uh, your, your, your case together. Anna, I'm going to do what you just did to me and say, how do you come back as a respondent? What are you going to do in that scenario? <laughs> so you're putting me in the very unpopular um, category of having to argue against sleep. So, um, But I suppose the way that I would do it is, is to just make the very clear point that it's just one aspect of life. It's not like you would sort of try and distinguish it from the, the veganism case and, and the evidence that we saw there and say, well, not every single moment during your life are you making choices about having a, a good night's sleep that evening. It's not when the moment you wake up, every single thing you do is directed towards that night's sleep. Uh, and just try and really draw that distinction there. The other thing that I could try and do is put a little bit of a spin on it and really focus in on the way that the belief has been pleaded. The belief is that this is eight hours sleep. And, and when you really hammer that point home, you may be able to pick apart at whether or not this is really weighty and substantial. Sleep, yes, but maybe not eight hours sleep. I don't think that that point would really necessarily win on, on that category, but it may really help to um, um, pick this uh, belief for the judge and really present this overall picture of it, it not being necessarily a, a qualifying belief, I think is the way I would try and go about doing it. Um, 
I suppose then turning to the fourth criterion, which is the cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance. Again, this is a pretty low threshold and there's been a relative lack of, of judicial guidance on it. Um, while there was the spiritualism case that went to the EAT, that um, the EAT merely found that the tribunal hadn't erred in their decision. And so there isn't a lot of guidance on what will um, meet this threshold. The other thing to consider is also how this is evidenced. There may be certain things that are so obvious that you can really ask the judge to take judicial notice of the fact that they're cogent and serious. But there may be things that require more um, more extensive evidence. So I wonder, Kerry, how that would apply to your example. I think if we're dealing with the, the non-binary example, I think that um, certainly what I'd be looking for is statistical evidence. How many individuals do you identify as non-binary? And I think that would be a really good way of showing that actually this is an important matter and an important belief. And also it would show cohesion. The more people that obviously um, adhere to that belief would help with that. Uh, medical reports and opinion that explain it and show how important it is to an individual again would, would go I think a far way in overcoming this hurdle and then I think there's a lot to be said about I think you touched on it before Anna about associations so evidence from groups organizations and associations that uh, exist to support in individuals that hold particular beliefs or, or, or in this case say that they're non-binary or believe they're non-binary uh, would really really help and any materials that they publish I'd be looking for those kind of things to show that um, the, the vegan case is a really good example of how to prepare a case um, to support this criteria. I don't know if anyone's looked at it, but the bundle is actually 1,200 pages or exceeds 1,200 pages um, for the preliminary hearing. And it included advice, uh, articles from leading experts about veganism, as well as some statistical information, estimates of the number of people that are vegan in, in the UK evidence of the societies and groups that are there to support vegans and the meetups. And I think one of the really important points of the evidence that was there was, was evidence that there is a, a booming vegan business industry at the moment, because that really does show that not only do people adhere to this belief and hold this belief, but actually there's that cohesion that businesses are feeling a need or a, a demand to help them in order to um, follow those beliefs. OK, why don't I pick up on the fifth of the discussion points? Um, I, I, my view is it's not going to be that often that this is going to be an issue, um, but there will be some cases. Um, it seems to me that attacks by respondents under this criterion are going to fall into two camps, I think. Firstly, where the belief is incompatible um, with, the, with the basic human rights of others. Um, and we've already touched on some of those, including the case I spoke to you about, um, but also cases where the belief in question is seriously offensive um, to, 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 to many people. Um, I think, in general, if one of us has a case on our desk which raises this issue, we're going to recognise it particularly quickly because we are specialist equality lawyers. And so we're going to, to, I think, be astute at picking up any case which really does trigger the application of this criteria in a careful way. I, I would say that if I was for a claimant and I feared that the, the, case, the case was going to fail along the lines of the case I've already taught, uh, spoken to you about um, today, because of the um, strength of those views and the intransigence of those views, then I, I think I would want to think long and hard about my pleading. What is that genuine belief? How far does it have to go before it is really in danger of crossing the line and, and of being a uh, falling foul of, of this fifth criterion? Does it have to be put in this really absolutist way um, or, or can I effectively tone it down a little in a way that still is compatible with the instructions that I'm getting from my client uh, and, and, and still therefore a proper case to put forward. Um, for respondents I would say when, when you have a case which seriously does raise this issue make sure you run it really well 
don't just turn up to tribunal thinking, oh, we've got a knockout point here. Produce the evidence, make the arguments uh, and make sure that, bear in mind, this is the final gateway that a claimant gets through. And you may well be a respondent who is pinning everything on this final gateway. Make sure that you do address it really carefully. I think going back to the three examples that we've thrown out for discussion today, I, I can't see how any of those examples are likely to trigger a challenge under the fifth, um, the fifth of, of, of the Granger um, points. I, I really don't. But those cases do exist. I think the important thing is to remember when you have one, make sure you deal with it properly and you address it head on from the beginning, because that point is not going to go away. Um, Finally, I think just to perhaps wrap up the conversation and, and the discussion that we've had, I think I'd just like to just draw out maybe four or five little key points to take from all this discussion. Firstly, the, the real importance of very early, careful case analysis. We have to do that at the beginning, in my view. What is the belief? How do we frame it? How does it fit with this framework in the Granger um, from the Granger case, where am I going to find evidence to support it? And, and to, to do that at the beginning, we need to make sure the case is pleaded really well. Whichever party you're representing, the, the way you plead this case can make the difference between winning and losing. The, the third point I would raise is your evidence. Make sure that you don't get lazy, do it properly. So your documentary evidence, for example, you might want to look at the employment audit trail. That might, for example, indicate where the prior complaint was made or whether this is a new belief that has never been mentioned before. It may well in illustrate what the claimant said about it previously. You may want to look at all the different types of external sources that, that, that you and Anna Kerry have touched on already. Reports, articles, going to bodies who have specialist knowledge of these kinds of areas. I personally would say, you know, you might want to do some really good social media stalking of the claimant uh, to, to, to really get to the bottom of, 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 of what's going on. Um, think about your witness evidence and your witness statements and make sure they really address these points head on. And don't, don't just tell the story in some loose and fluid way. Make sure you tackle these issues properly. And finally, um, there may not be that many cases that need it but there is a place for expert evidence in some of these cases that might be what is needed to win the judge round to your way of thinking so i think for me that the, the, the big point to take from this webinar is you can do these cases this threshold is really important part of them so if you're going to do it whichever side you're on do it really well and start that process at the very beginning and, and not very late in the litigation when you're then really struggling and paying catch, uh, playing catch up. So that's where that's where I would uh, leave what I have to say about it. Kerry, Anna, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think you summed it up perfectly. I think that the time really needs to be spent at the beginning just to make sure it, it, it's put right. I think that the, the way that the belief is put has got the potential to win or lose a case, hasn't it? So it's just as much time as we'd spend um, considering what the correct PCP is in a, a reasonable adjustment case or an indirect discrimination case, we need to be putting that same time, effort and energy into drilling down to what the right belief is in, in, in a case of philosophical belief. Thank you. OK, well, we're just running over our time now. We will be around for questions. If anyone wants to pose any questions um, via the meeting chat, then please do do that. Uh, I think we'll probably stick around for a little while um, so um, we're, we're very pleased to answer any questions that you may have and uh, don't be slow in coming forward with them is all I would say. Okay, nothing coming through yet. So for those of you who are leaving the seminar, once again, thank you for joining us. We hope you found it useful. And if there are any issues arising that you don't want to raise by chat, you want to pick up the phone and speak to one of us, 
please don't hesitate to do that. We're always here and happy to help. Have a good day, everyone.